Okay, so greetings and welcome to today's educational program on facilitation skills. This is Doug Wood with the ASQ Quality Management Division. I'm joining the program today from Fairway, Kansas. Uh, both the Quality Management Division and the Statistics Divisions of ASQ are sponsoring this talk. Uh, today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenters organizations. We will send out an email 24 hours after the talk at the address you registered under. Uh, this will document your recertification units for attending this event. We're looking forward to your great comments and your questions during the program. We invite you to you know, shut off your cell phone, close the door, warm up your fingers, and give us your input. We have a chat window here for you to chat to. We also have a Q&A window over there on the right-hand side. You may use either of those to send messages, uh, you know, messages or chat messages. Um, so if you have a comment or question, please do that. Now today we have the pleasure of hearing from Grace Duffy. Please join me in welcoming her. Grace has over 40 years experience in successful business and process management in corporate, government, education, and healthcare. Grace uses her experience as president, CEO, and senior manager to help organizations improve. She's authored 13 tasks, uh, additional book chapters, and many articles on quality, leadership, and organizational performance. She's a frequent speaker and trainer. Grace holds an MBA from Georgia State University. She's an ASQ CMQOE, uh, CQIA, uh, Six Sigma Greenbelt, and CQA. Grace also has the Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. She's an ASQ Fellow and a Distinguished Service Medalist. So, Grace? Well, Doug, thank you. I appreciate that introduction. And, Doug, I want to thank you and Stephen Schalke for your support through the Quality Management and Statistics Division. The two of you are doing a lot of work to make these materials available to our ASQ members, and I really appreciate that volunteer commitment. None of us get paid for this. This is what a professional society is for, and I just think this is, this is just fun. We've got 311 of our closest friends here. And I want to share a little bit about facilitation skills that I've picked up over some of those last 40 or 45 years. Some of this you're going to see as looking familiar because facilitation skills shows up in a number of our bodies of knowledge with professions. The two that I'm looking at most specifically is, are the CMQOE, uh, Section 1C4, and Team Roles and Responsibilities, also in the CQE um, body of knowledge, 1E1 in Facilitation Principles and Techniques. Facilitation is also a subcategory within the Certified Quality Improvement Associate, and you'll see a slide here very soon that I pull out of the Quality 101 prep courses that we teach for the CQIA. So I'll spend a little time at the beginning of, of this presentation to talk about the roles and responsibilities, how we as facilitators work within a team. Then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and use a different term we talk for facilitators, the idea of a coach. And we'll go through seven rules of coaching that I have found to be very, very helpful. Uh, we'll also share some uh, uh, Lencioni's uh, seven or five dysfunctions of a team. I th I've found them to be very useful. Then we'll wrap this up with a, uh, some, what do you do, what, what do you do when you have some difficult people either in the team or frankly that difficult person is you. All of us have those days. So I'll spend that time. Uh, Doug is going to watch the, uh, the chat and the Q&A area. Uh, if there are disturbances, if I start running amok here, Doug can interrupt and, and stop me and, and get, us, get us back on, on track. This is the slide that comes out of the Certified Quality Improvement Associate Handbook. Uh, Sandy uh, Furterer and I are working right now in the fourth edition of the CQIA Handbook for the Quality Management Division. The body of knowledge changed this year. So for those of you who want to take the CQIA under the old body of knowledge, take it before August of 2020. Our book will be out for the, for the next body of knowledge at World Conference next year. So let's look at the different roles of the team. Certainly, we know the sponsor and the champion. Those two roles have been separated over the last several years. Used to be we talk about them interchangeably, not necessarily so. It's the uh, sponsor really has the budget authority, allocates the resources. Champion comes in and, and is really the cheerleader, the high business leader, the one who can give you the visit visibility for what you need. 
What I'll be talking about a lot today is the juxtaposition between what the team leader does in directing the content efforts and working with stakeholders and what the facilitator does more on the behavioral side, the tools, and the, uh, the more the qualitative side of where we go. And we'll see some of these slides a little later on. And then there's always the member. You know, we can't do anything without members. And the whole idea of facilitators and team leaders are to get the subject matter experts and to get the excellence of the team members in to get the real work done. So we'll talk through some of these, some of these roles. Now, the facilitator has a bunch of different other terms. We can be helpers, we can be trainers, we can be advisors, we can be coach. Uh, mentor is another term that I get, I hear uh, talked about quite a bit. We want to help team members be most effective. We are the ones who really want to help the team to grow. We want to help the individual members to grow their careers. We're the ones who seem to be a little more touchy-feely than maybe the team leader who has to worry about the outcomes and the, and the measures. And again, I've got a slide that'll help you with that a little later on. So what is it that we do? We observe, we sort of back off a little bit and watch how the team members are working with each other. We're gonna suggest process changes and we're gonna facilitate those positive movements toward the goals and objectives. We're not gonna do that alone though. We need to work in tandem with the team leader. So the facilitator and the team leader are meeting and comparing notes and planning before we ever go into either the virtual team room or into the real team room, or we want to make sure that we're talking off the same page uh, while we're working with the team activities. Certainly, the facilitator is going to step up and support multiple conversations. We're going to try and keep the uh, the group on focus on 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 a goal of where we go. We're going to support the team leader in keeping uh, us on focus. A lot of these functions here you'll see are things that that become part of what we put into a team charter or. The the team A3, and the facilitator needs to work with the team leader on, on setting up these activities. Now, the facilitator also will come in and help to guide individuals. You know, all of us have our days when we're going to be in control, so we've always got to speak up as the first person. There's always somebody who is there to be recognized, and, and sometimes the, the facilitator just needs to say, okay, we haven't heard from Sheila for a while, let's, let's give her an opportunity, or I see that Jorge has been raising his hands for a while and has been trying to be a gentleman about this, but he hasn't been able to get a word in edgewise, let's give him a chance. So we wanna work with those behavioral and those, those subtle moments and, and be aware of what goes on. We are gonna need to help the team leader if people go off topic, or to, to try and wrap things up, make sure uh, you may have a scribe, you may have the timekeeper, and so the facilitator may may help the timekeeper to, to follow the agenda and to keep the, the conversation going. And then either during the conversations, during the team, or uh, in between meetings, uh, the facilitator may provide some additional training, might be able to do some team building, some conflict management. Very often I've been asked either on webinars uh, remotely during teams, a lot with uh, uh, healthcare organizations, I'll just dial in during their, their monthly or their weekly meetings and they'll ask me to do a little bit of team building or conflict management or share a little bit of, of some sort of management techniques virtually so I don't, they don't have to pay me to fly over to Kansas City, heaven forbid, and fly back home again. So there's a lot of things that we can do, do as facilitators. So what else do we do? We do need to have some training and facilitation skills. Some of this is just an awareness. Certainly we wanna be respected by the team members. It helps if we have uh, good etiquette, it helps that we're tactful, it helps that if we have a decent reputation, it helps that we're friendly. Uh, we need to back off, sort of what it, what is that Kenny Rogers say, no one to hold them and no one to fold them, just kind of figure out when to intervene and when not. We want to help with the team's process and to support the behavior, but we don't want to step on the team leader. And that gets to be a bit of an issue with me if I'm in on a 
project that I've been involved with before, there are times when I've had to just bite my tongue on content because that's what not what I'm there for. It helps me when I'm a third party, I come in, I don't necessarily know how a particular client is, is managing their content. So it's easier for me to bounce around the side of suggesting tools and behaviors and conversations. I need to respect the team leader. I need to realize that the team leader is the one who finally calls the shots. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk to them over you know, tea and crumpets or whatever in between the meetings to make sure we know where we're going, but the team leader is the one who calls it. I need to make sure that I'm confidential. We're hearing things. We hear things during the meeting. We hear things between meetings. Very often, if you have that respect from bullet number one, what you're going to also see is that people will come to you and will share things with you. They'll share, oh, there I have another agenda, or I've got a problem with Susie over here in the corner, or I, I've worked with somebody else in previous uh programs and I really don't want to work with them again. Those are the kinds of conversations that you sort of need to keep to yourself and then also help the people work through them without blaring them out to the world. The other piece is we need to make sure that we are not viewed as a spy. We do not want to be running back to management on any proprietary information to the team. Now, saying that, Many of you work in a matrix management environment where your supervisor is not your team leader. Your supervisor may not even be your project or program leader. So understand as you put your charters together, understand as you put your communication plan together, how the facilitator works relative to the chain of command for your organization, because it does matter. And be open with the employees, be open with your, your team members in just how that works. So let me change the slide here again. All right, so where are we? We're facilitating with QI teams. What's the purpose? And here we come back to the issues of the charter, the issues of the outcomes of the, of the, the project or the program we're doing. What we want to do with the QI teams is create a partnership with the leader, with the coach, with the team members. All of you know forming, storming, norming, and performing. We've got, got that and the adjourning piece, so I won't do any more with that particular slide. We do want to help the team get to higher levels of achievement. The facilitator is the one who watches. For those of you who are familiar, especially in healthcare, with that term of high-performing organization, we want to use the skills of teamwork. And as a matter of fact, I had a note at the beginning of these slides, a lot of this information comes out of the Schulte's team handbook. So you can go back and review a lot of those materials. I'm sure that you have it on your shelf if you're a certified manager of quality organizational excellence or if you're a CQE. Certainly, if you're a CQA or a CQIA, you've got, to, got that on your shelf. The team leader, or the team, pardon me, excuse me, the facilitator wants to help overcome obstacles. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into conflict at the end of the hour. But we want to look for where there are barriers. We want, and many of you who know that I'm involved in this modular Kaizen concept, want to reduce disruptions. We want to find out how we can lean out our team we want not to not the individuals we we'll lean out the conversations the activities we want to get rid of the speed bumps so that we're getting to the goals of what we need within that team and we want to work closely with the team leader as we're doing that yeah, politically sensitive situations, those things are going to be there all the time. And you know, sometimes it's easier for the facilitator to take on that political discomfort and allow the team leader to step away from it so that they can keep the, their eye on the goal and on the ball to keep the project moving, to keep the process improvement team moving. And then the facilitator can take the barbs on the political piece and say, oh, geez, that was awkward or whatever it is, and sort of of divide and conquer with that one. The other thing, again, provide training and problem-solving assistance, what we want to do all the time. We want to keep our antenna out all the time, watching for areas where people can stumble. What are some other things that we're doing as part of that partnership with the team? Here we go again with the team charter, with the A3. 
what are our ground rules? Let's make sure that we as a facilitator follow those ground rules. We want to be seen following the requirements and the agreements that we've made. We want to walk the talk. We want to make sure that we're clear in what we talk about and we're clear in expectations of behavior within the team. We want to work with the timekeeper. We want to work with the uh, uh, team leader on making sure we meet time frames. Uh, as a facilitator, uh, I very often will have telephone calls or virtual meetings or emails, uh, especially if I'm not on site, uh, with team members in between uh, formalized meetings so that we can make sure that we're meeting our time frames. I'm chair of the uh, Healthcare Quality and Improvement Committee. I share that with uh, the Healthcare Division with Pierce Story, and he and I are forever swapping emails back and forth, making sure that we have done anything we can to support our team authors for the monographs that we're building for that particular com um, committee. We certainly work with the team leader for goals and measures of success, and we'll, I've got a nifty little chart here we'll get to in just a bit for that one. And in fact, here it is, voila. This is one that uh, Jack Moran and I put together uh, with Les Beitch, who is part of the, uh, the Public Health Foundation and the uh, Public Health Accreditation Board, to really look at the juxtaposition between a team leader and what a team facilitator does in the work of a process improvement team. We see this as, as, a, as a target, and in the middle is the problem statement or the opportunity statement or the aim of the project or the program. Now, if you have the measurement of an aim, it needs to be very discreet. You need to have the scope of what it is you're working on. It has to be measurable, and it has to be time-bound. Most of you remember those SMART objectives. That's really what we're talking about. But if you look at the angle from 11 o'clock on this clock down to four. This is pretty much the continuum or the role of the team leader. The team leader is going to look at the measurements of the outcomes of the process improvement or the project team. We want to make sure that the project team, process improvement team, meets the outcomes that the sponsor and the champion have identified. We need to make sure that the process, that we have enough capacity to meet that process improvement activity. Excuse me, I'm going to cough on you for just a minute. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll be right back. Brought a cold home from London last week. It was raining in London town, so forgive me. I was hoping I'd make it, but okay, we'll get there. Um, anyway, I was talking about the team leader needs to make sure that we have enough capacity for the team to get the job done, but we also need to make sure that the process improvement, the new process that we're identifying, if it's a, an improvement of process, if it's a redesign of the process, we need to make sure that that capacity is, is sufficient. We also need to make sure that the process is defined, the teamwork process, but also the process under, under study. We have to work with that. The team leader also needs to make sure that the scope of the project is understood, whether it's an operational scope or a strategic scope, because all of you know that we view issues differently. Some of us are like Dr. Deming. And we want to look at the data first. We want to look at the detail. We want to get into the weeds to really understand what are the roots of this issue and what's going on. Then there are those of us like me who get my head in the clouds and I just think the whole world's a stage and I want to just strategically look at what's the whole concept of what we're trying to do here. And then I forget to get my feet on the ground to really get the job done. So the team leader is the one who's going to keep that, keep the herding of the cats going. Now, the other, the other angle here we've got uh, uh, from, uh, what, 1 o'clock all the way down to, what's that, 7 o'clock? Okay, whatever it is. Looking at my clock. Yeah, that's right. The, the team facilitator is going to get more involved in these items. If we look at the focus down there at 7 o'clock, is the team working on internal focus or external focus? That sort of corresponds to the SWOT that we do, the strengths and weaknesses of the internal process, external the opportunities and threats, looking forward, where what's our risk analysis, what, what are the uh, exposures, what are also the opportunities that the, uh, the team can, can exhibit and, and can exploit and what we're doing. So the facilitator is going to be watching to see how the team addresses internal and external activities. 
and what we do. And the other piece is that as we work on a project, you know that there are some areas that teams work on, like if you have a departmental team, you probably control what goes on in your world. You can make a change, and because you control the outcome of that change, it's relatively easy. But if you get out to the influence edge of, of this particular project or process improvement, you may only be able to impact other people's response to change around that particular process improvement. And the facilitator has a responsibility to help the team lead, to, to help the team members and the team leader see what other stakeholders, that in the, in the, the uh, charter is the communication plan. And the facilitator needs to have a good enough understanding of the organization to know where those influences are, where are the impacts, how do we work with others, what are the communication flows within the organization that we need to consider. So certainly that's uh, the uh, the facilitator has a great, great role in supporting the organ the uh, the process improvement team and is probably going to work at that point very closely with the sponsor or with and or with the champion. And then if you also have the process owner who is a separate person, the facilitator is a really great supporter and, and good avenue for working with the process owner. All right, so let's take a look at some things that can come up. The team facilitator, and we're going to move into coaching here in just a minute, is going to work with that team leader. Now, very often it's the team leader who's going to work with the team sponsor to identify who should be on that team to begin with. The team leader very often will work with the facilitator, and as a matter of fact, one of the chapters in the Modular Kaizen uh, textbook is uh, written by a NASA quality facilitator who worked very closely early before the team was ever ever really had its kickoff meeting to coach the team members to make sure they had all, any kind of training, to make sure that all of that was in place before we ever really started to bite into process improvement or to gather the data around the symptoms of what we were seeing. So the facilitator is going to help coach those groups into that forming and storming phase, moving it over into the norming phase. Certainly, the facilitator can help and support uh, the objectives, kind of watch for the hidden agendas. I like this one, move to commitment and accountability. The facilitator can exhibit these behaviors of being committed to the team, of being accountable, being there on time, making sure that the facilitator has met all their responsibilities, being a good role model for the other team member. And I like this last one, too, from hoping to acting. Gee, I sure hope this will work. Well, no, we don't just hope. We chose the right people on the team. You're the right people. We know you can get it done. And the facilitator, to a certain extent, is also going to be a cheerleader, just like the champion is. The facilitator is working offline with a sponsor and the champion. There's no question at all. And that also is a point that shows that the facilitator has the respect of the champion and the sponsor. If a facilitator doesn't have the respect of the champion of the sponsor, they might as well just pack it up. You really need to have good relationships. Again, part of the communication plan of the project. What are some other things? Efficiency. Curtain cats. I mean, when you're forming and storming, that's going to happen. People are, you're just not used to your roles yet. We're going to get it there. But the facilitator is going to help expedite getting to that norming stage. Again, modeling success. I've talked about that already. Sharing the values and the vision of the organization. One of the major things that I do when I go on site with clients if I can see in the lobby normally or in one of the conference rooms the vision and the mission and the value of the organization, or I'll pull it off the company's website before I fly in, in town, and I will use that as part of the introduction to either the training event or the process improvement activities that we're working on, just to remind all of us and then to get the, the employees, the team members, to tell me why those values and vision are so important. And it really sets the stage for the culture of that particular process improvement activity. All of us are going to get frustrated. All of us are going to trip over things. That's some of the features of the new Agile concept as Agile moves or as Lean moves on into the terminology of Agile of that fail fast and move forward. We don't want to forget that Lean says plan it first so it doesn't fail, but Murphy is going to happen. 
And so we do need to be aware that we're going to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and start all over again, and, and we keep people going. The other neat thing about a facilitator is that we probably don't hold anybody's time card. And so we can look at people and be delighted in who they are without worrying at the next performance review. We're going to have to say they're a one performer because we smiled at them nicely. The facilitator has a great ability to be supportive of individuals in their career group. Sorry, I just got on my soapbox. I remember doing that for a couple of folks. I'll change my tone of voice. Here are the five dysfunctions of a team. This is this Patrick Lencioni. This book's now a little bit old, but it is so good. He really nailed this one. Uh, this uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team was a big textbook in graduate programs, MBA programs for uh, classes in leadership. And I really like this for the role of a facilitator. Here are the five dysfunctions. If we don't have trust, if there's conflict, if people are not committed, if they're not accepting responsibility, or we aren't focused on results. And I like the, the setup of this, this pyramid. In the absence of trust, the facilitator can be vulnerable. It's okay for the facilitator to say, oops. It's okay for the facilitator to say, I made a mistake, if you really did. Now, don't just fall on your sword if you didn't, because that's going to lose your reputation, too. However, trust, and many of you have been through the uh, Quality 101 training, you know that the characteristics wheel that Russ Westcott put together has trust as one of the very critical components. If we have fear of conflict, and we'll come up to this a little bit later, I don't know, demand debate, but encourage debate. Conflict is actually a good thing. And if the facilitator can show the importance of getting different views and getting different ideas, it ends up being considerations rather than conflict. And we resolve those conflicts by looking at the facts, by looking at the situations, by understanding where we need to go and identifying those common goals. Certainly, if there's lack of commitment, we as facilitators do want to be real clear with the team members where we're going, why we're here, and how we can seek closure to get to the results that are necessary. Avoidance of accountability, that's going to be pairing with the team leader, with the process owner, and maybe with supervisors if we need to. We all are here for specific outcomes, and the facilitator can watch early to see if we're starting to go off in different, different um, uh, directions and if people are not accepting their responsibilities. And then certainly, we need to help the team leader fire and drive toward those results. There will be difficult issues. There will be problems. We need to address them. Facilitator usually has a pretty strong uh, emotional in, in, intelligence, uh, and we can we can help with that quite a bit. All right, let me keep moving. Here, we, let me swap now to the facilitator as a coach. There are these seven rules of coaching. I'll go through these relatively quickly because they're they're all pretty much direct. What are the things we do? How do we get to that culture of commitment and accountability out of the Lencioni pyramid? Start where your client is, not where you think he should be. And this is difficult for me, too, because many of you who know me know that I'm Pollyanna. I love everybody when I first meet you. And then you got to work really hard to disappoint me. So I'm always sure that you are absolutely the best that you are ever going to be. Well, that's an issue if the client's looking for additional training, if they're looking for additional work. So as a facilitator, we really have to observe closely and well to figure out where a person or a situation is and how we can make it better or how we can expedite their uh, growth on their own. How do we confirm the readiness of an individual or a team? Are they ready to be coached? Are they interested in listening? Do they want to be coached? Many of you know that term of I was voluntold to be on this team. We need to choose that people will have a disappointment. If they've been requested uh, to get the coaching, are they told to get it? And then you need to work through and show the value of what you can offer to them. What do they expect to get from coaching? Well, ask them and figure out what it is. Also, you can talk to the team leader, you can talk to the sponsor, you can talk to the process owner, and get a feeling for where those roles would like their, your team members to be. And then you, you start work on helping them to get, get where, where the team as a whole needs to be. How do we set expectations? You know you can get this from the, from the charter. What are the goals of the organization? 
I'm not here to help run the team content-wise. That's for the team leader to do, although I'm certainly watching and listening and expediting. I want to certainly build trust. That's the overlap between the Lencioni piece. Who do I have to report your results to? I need to be real clear who our sponsor is, who we report to for stage gates. I need to be clear with people just how much I'm going to share with what goes on, that always Las Vegas rule. We'll probably see that a little bit later. And then we also want to be clear when and where the coaching will take place. Do we do it offline? Do we do it during the meeting? Uh, generally, you coach positively during the meeting. If you're going to be doing some uh, constructive coaching, you probably want to do that separately offline and at that the uh, uh, privately with the individual. Then you want to watch the team. Fourth real LeCoy, watch the destructive behaviors. See if you can ease them off to the side without being disruptive to the meeting. Help the team leader kind of kind of belay some of some of the uh, the conflict that's going on. If there are issues that are very specific, yes, write them down because certainly at the end. Somebody who has a problem may or may not want to admit it. If there are issues that you really do need to take to a supervisor, actually a facilitator, you want to take it to the team leader and help the team leader because they're the ones who are going to need to take it uh, wherever it needs to go. But you can document the individual strengths and weaknesses because those are things that either you can support with or the process owner or you can share some of the material, depending on matrix management, with supervisors or especially a team leader. So figure out what's blocking and hindering the individual's progress and then work with them individually or as teams in moving forward. Develop a, de establish a development plan. If you're working one-on-one -on -one or with a team, what are the behaviors that we want? Certainly we had the ground rules already. What are the impacts? What are the good impacts and bad impacts of behavior across the team? What are the causes that lead to those bad outcomes? We can even do five whys on our own behavior. What are, the, what are we, our expectations of change? How are we going to deal with change? Individuals can feel a sense of loss, even if they're the ones who are encouraging the process improvement. Now, you want to plan people, help people plan around their strengths. Certainly, that's a lot of what coaching and mentoring does anyway. So we want to use those skills with our, with our facilitation. Then we want to help with corrective actions. We want to help people either encouraging training or maybe doing some of the offline mentoring or coaching, sharing with textbooks. I've been doing mentoring and coaching for years. Uh, there's a very good friend of mine who's now a, a master black belt herself. And heaven forbid, I've been coaching her for 20 years, and she's now coaching me. It's just, it's a great relationship. Indicate any training may be required, anything that we can share. Uh, many of you know me. I'm forever shipping uh, articles around for people and saying, hey, look what I found. This was really cool, and, and sharing what I find. So here's the seventh rule of coaching, confidentiality. What stays in Vegas? There are times when you can just ruin any ounce of trust you had by blabbing something that you saw, and for sure you don't want to talk about anything that hasn't had any grounding for uh, the truth of what happened. You want to be real careful with what you do as a facilitator. If you have to share information to someone higher in the organization, make that part of the initial understanding and expectations in the team. If you have been asked to share ideas and opportunities for development plans for individuals, make sure that they know that you have been asked by their supervisor to share information. So there are ways that you can do that. And as long as it's up front and the employee knows it and the supervisor knows it and you know it, it's fine. But just, just don't have any surprises on that one. How are we doing here? Follow up, seventh rule. Don't just dump and run. Make sure you follow up with the team. Make sure that we're making progress. What I like to do in a team is, is every once in a while, maybe not every team meeting, but maybe once a quarter, once every couple of months, talk about where have we been, where are we going, where are we on this realm of, of team formation, uh, how are we working, not only with the content, but with the tools and how we're working with each other. I do still get uh, emails from folks I've been mentoring or t from team members that I've been involved in over the last, geez, 20-some years on how they're doing and what they're doing. And I love it. I think it's just been really great. And you can do the same thing. So let's take a look. Listening and communicating. We need to be able to listen. For those of you who read Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of, uh, of Highly Effective People, one of, I, 
I love this one thing. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. And I like that for a couple of reasons. One is if I listen to the other person first, it shows that I respect them, that I really care what they're thinking and what they're, they mean and what, they, what they're in this team for. On the other hand, I'm listening. That helps me then to choose how I'm going to relate to this other person. The other piece is, if there happens to be any conflict in there, I know who's sniping at me from the bushes. So there's a two-way side to that listening and communicating. And certainly we've had our communication plan together that we put into the, to the charter and how we're going to work with each other as teams. Now here's an interesting communications model just to have it in your head. Certainly we meet, with, we work with the message and with the noise. Certainly for those of you in statistics, you know Shuhart with his noise and, and, and signal. So if we start with the message over at 12 o'clock on this clock, the message comes out and it goes out across the channel. Well, there's going to be noise in there everywhere. There is noise in people's opinions. There's noise in people's agendas. There's noise in people's backgrounds. There's noise in, in what's uh, happening other places in the plant or in the organization or the office. So the message has to get across that channel to a receiver. The receiver has to receive the message and then separate the message from the noise. Again, statistics, they put it down on paper. For me as an anthropology major, I sort of get it into my brain. Then the receiver needs to turn it around and feedback to the source that said, yep, I either got it or I didn't. That's one of the reasons why when we're told as team leaders or told as presenters, repeat back what you think you heard. Validate and verify that what you took in is what the speaker expected you to receive. So this is something that we need to think about and keep using as facilitators all the time. The other piece that uh, I have to be careful of, uh, I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm left-handed, so I'm one of those right brain people. What we want to do is balance in a team our ideas and our feelings. Remember, there's the facts, there's qualitative, and there's quantitative. We actually need both. Now, the quantitative is Dr. Deming, give me the facts, what's the issue, what do we need to deal with? Then there's Dr. Duran on where do we want to go as an organization? What is the mission? What is the value? The feelings are more the culture and the behaviors of what we do. Now, we want to keep that balance between the ideas, which pretty much is the team leader, and the feelings, which can be both, but the, the facilitator is going to be working with those behaviors, with the uh, emotions and, and the dynamics of what goes on in a team or an individual coaching or mentoring situation. When you get that set up out of balance, that's when you get stress. People know that there's something wrong. We're either emoting too much and having too many feelings, or if the, the seesaw hits down the other way, we're dealing too cold with facts and we're forgetting that this is an organization with living, breathing people. So the facilitator is there to try and maintain that balance or to restore it if we start losing it. Now, okay, we've got, what, about 17 minutes left, and I want to give us a chance for question and answer. We're just about, we're into this last section of dealing with difficult people. As a facilitator, I want to watch when somebody's, I don't know the word difficult, when, you know it, when there's somebody who's, who's, whose behavior is just a little bit different than the norm, that may be just fine. They may still be within a process capability of how people are supposed to be working in that team. However, we want to back off and just watch for a little bit and look at the behavior and not necessarily the person. Here's this listen piece again. Get their perspective. Why are they coming at me or why are they expressing maybe a strong uh, opinion or maybe they're looking um, uh, disdainful or in some way or, or, or disgruntled or depressed or discouraged. There's something that you, you realize you want to help with. So how do you then deal with that? Well, maintain your own self-worth. Don't get involved in, in their situation. Perceive it, see what goes on, and just deal with that current situation of what, what happens. Now, what happens if the difficult person is you? All of us have those days. Facilitators are not immune. 
We're allowed to have colds. We're allowed to have had a really nasty meeting right before we come into this one. We're allowed to be up against as many deadlines as I know all of you are. So how, what happens if the difficult person is me? Well, what we want to do is don't take it out on somebody else. Don't nag at anybody else on that. Look at yourself. Look at step outside yourself like an avatar and say what's going on. You can still direct you, you can address the issues of the team. You can ignore or separate yourself from whatever's bugging you. You don't want to blame other people for how you're feeling that day. Stay focused on the activity. Negotiate with yourself on just, what's this issue? How can I step away from it and do what I need to do to support the team leader and support the team? Realign the priority. Say my priority right now is to manage with the team or to mentor with this employee, and I'm going to mean I'm going to get that done. Just Keep your mouth shut, don't babble on it. Every once in a while, you just go, okay, let it go, let it go. I can deal with this and, and uh, move on. Just kind of be kind to yourself. If people are coming at you with things, and I, I use this little little uh, Star Trek, the old Star Trek uh, uh, picture here when they put their shields up. If people are going to throw it, stuff at you, sticks and stones may break by bones, facilitators are targets. What we want to do is filter out items that can be painful. Pretend you're Sherlock Holmes. Just look at the facts. Look at what goes on. And you know, every once in a while, they might be right. And the most disarming thing you can look at and say to somebody is, you know, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, you're right. This is really the way we ought to go with this. Uh, I, I agree with you. Let's go do it. So there are things that we can, we can do as facilitators to realize that we're human beings as well. When you disagree with others, you can hear them. You want to make sure not only that you hear them, but you listen to what they're saying. You can acknowledge that they are they can have their opinion, especially when you're going through that forming and norming stage in a team. Acknowledging is not agreeing. Acknowledging says, I respect you as an individual. I may not agree with what you're saying. Acknowledging may not be yielding. Um, acknowledging versus yielding. If, in fact, you acknowledge and realize that they are correct, then yes, you can, you can yield in, in a, uh, uh, a mature sort of way. Oops, one more. Can't do a double click on that one. Here we go. And then build a loyalty plan back to the team. Hear what they're saying. Clarify what the issues are. Engage in dialogue. Gain the agreement. This is really decision making, basically decision making with what we do in, in, uh, in, in problem solving. Summarize the issue, act and follow up, and then hand it off to the others in, in what we do. All right, here we are. What have I done? I've talked about the role of the team facilitator. I've tied it to the bodies of knowledge of what we've done. I shared with you some ideas of facilitation and coaching. Uh, we've looked at the seven roles of coaching. I've shared with you some ideas of dealing with difficult people, including when that difficult people is yourself. Uh, there are times when all of us just have a bad day and there are things that we can do. What I'd like to do is turn this back to Doug at this point and open it up for discussion. Doug knows what's going on with the chat. Doug knows what's going on with the Q&A. And so let me hand it back to you. And then at the end of things here, we'll have um, uh, a way for you to contact me. There I am. OK, cell phone. I travel a lot. The cell phone usually works. I buy the international when I go across the oceans, and it works. Uh, that's my email address, and I answer emails. Uh, some of you I can see just on my screen have already found me on LinkedIn and are, are connecting, and I will most certainly do that. So let me change the slide one more time here, and then let me see. Yep, Doug, you can take it back, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Grace. Uh, that was <laughs> that was wonderful. I, I appreciate your you know moving moving through it like that, like you did. Uh, uh, it, it's tough to fit this in 45 minutes, especially since we started a little bit late. So yes, we've had a couple of questions from people, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through them here. First of all, uh, you know, you have Grace's email from the slide. Uh, Grace, they might want copies of the slide deck. Can you, uh, can, you know, can you provide that if they send you an email? Sure, I'm happy to send it to you. Okay, so uh, again, uh, Grace's contact information is in the chat window. 
Uh, it's also in the Q&A. So uh, just send Grace an email, and she will be able to get you that, that information. So um, we, we'd like to do a couple of questions here. So a couple of people asked me, what is the, uh, the, the Schultz's, Schultz's book, Schultz's book? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Schultz's Team Handbook. It has, it's in the second or third edition. Uh, I believe you can probably get it used off of Amazon. Um, Spell the name. S-C-H-U-L-T-E-S. -E uh, and let me, I'm trying to think. I am connected to my speaker, uh, so I can't get up to my, my um, bookshelf and get it. Okay. Um, actually, hold on. Uh, Doug, talk to them for 30 seconds. I'll go get it and I'll be right back. Sure, fantastic. Do that. Okay. Um, you know, she'll she'll get the the book and uh, we'll she'll give you the title of the book, or ISBN, whatever that has to be, so that you can find it. Amazon is probably the best place to go for that book. Uh, so, want to make sure that you all understand about ASQ and some of the things we do here. ASQ has. Uh, you know, okay, poor Doug. Access. He's sitting there trying to do shadow puppets on the wall That's as okay. I walk away from things. That's okay. Um, we're good. It's called the Team Handbook. It's the third edition by Peter Schultes, S-C-H-O-L-T-E-S, -E Brian Joyner, J-O-I-N-E-R, and Barbara Streibel, S-T-R-E-I-B-E-L. It's oh, by cool. Oriel Publishing, O-R-I-E-L, and you can find it. I'm sure you can get it used on Amazon. Th it's thanks been around for a John. long time. Yeah, thanks to John Bloodworth. There's a link to Amazon oh, in the chat window. Oh, thank you, window. John. So, oh, good wonderful. man. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's fantastic. It's good to uh, have friends. Yes, it is. So, again, uh, ASQ has resources of all different kinds of things. This is not an ASQ book she's talking about, but, you know, uh, not everything is an ASQ book. ASQ sells books by other people all the time. Well, um, it's on the reference list for the CQIA uh, prep course. If you go on to the CQIA uh, certification website on ASQ.org, yep. it's one of the references for the CQIA. Okay. So, so we, had, we had two specific questions, Grace, about facilitation. <laughs> one of them was, that should the team facilitator and team leader always be separate people, even in small teams? And along with that, someone else asked, is it possible to comment on smaller companies, like you have 30 or 40 people with limited resources, where the facilitator and the team leader are the same person? What do you, what do you say about that? Ooh, I love that, and I, I get that question a lot. <sighs> Years ago, we said the team leader and the facilitator could most certainly be the same person. And yes, they certainly can. It is a lot to chew off. It is a huge change of hats for the team leader to be involved in the content and following the conversation, and then back off with another part of your brain or your soul to watch the behaviors of what's going on in the room. Just think about the difference between the quantitative or the real hard uh, awareness of the content of what you're trying to do and then the soft skills of, but how are we doing it? Can it be done? Of course it can. It is, it is difficult. It is difficult. It is going to make you a very, very strong, very valuable person to be able to put those both of those roles in the same person. Have I done it? Sure. It's you're going to be a tired puppy after the meeting. Okay. Um, so the uh, I, I think another comment. See if you agree with me here, Grace. Another idea is that if you're a small company and it's the leader running the meeting and you don't have a trained facilitator. You know, anyone whom the team trusts can step in and be a facilitator for a limited time. I've seen that happen in smaller companies um, where, you know, a team member who basically understands what a facilitator has to do may, you know, enter into that role and then back out of it again. But I guess they have to be trusted by the team, right? That's very true, and yes, you can get, you do not have to have a full-time facilitator. Facilitator is somebody, if they've been a trusted member of the organization for a long time, sometimes the champion or the sponsor will even serve as the facilitator because they have that level of respect and position within the organization. 
You have to be a little bit careful with that, having just said, because very often the sponsor or the champion may be the second or third line manager of the people who are in the team, and then the intimidation factor comes in, especially yeah. if it's a small company. Yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, I, I tell people, if you're the boss, you cannot relinquish your bossness. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't, yeah, it it doesn't work. It no, doesn't go it away. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. Uh, we have a question here uh, by MN. He says, uh, is there a difference between coaching and facilitation? Yes, yes. Facilitation can include coaching, but coaching insinuates uh, a closer relationship one-on-one, -on -one, individually. Coaching, although certainly team coaching, you're looking more at the person as human behaviors. Facilitating, you might be facilitating tools, you might be facilitating a conversation. Coaching is more a personal thing. You coach a person, you facilitate a tool or a conversation. Boy, that's the best I've ever heard put. Thank you, Grace. Uh, another comment here. Uh, someone, uh, I think it was Katrina, says uh, Marshall Goldsmith notes that when yes. you get feedback or information and you don't know how to respond, you can always respond with thank you without causing offense. Any other responses make sense to you? I like that. Of Yeah, not that you're right, but just thank you. I like that. Thank you. And yes, Marshall Goldsmith is a good one. I agree. Well said. Thank you. Okay. Uh let me let me take one more uh scroll here through the uh through the chat window and see if there's anything else here. Uh I I'm, I'm kind of jumping back and forth between chat and Q&A. Uh No, I appreciate see. you doing that. And I'm getting yeah. huge many many requests for these slides. It'll take me a while to answer all of them. Oh. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> That's it's, okay. That's okay. It, it, not everybody, you know, wants them, but so we don't That's we don't right. broadcast them. No, uh, there's no need. I'm fine. <clears throat> okay, you guys so are worth it. This is good. Uh, we we are getting a question. Uh, you know, uh, surveys or other tools to get feedback as a facilitator. In other words, a survey you could use as a facilitator to find out how a good job you did being a facilitator. I do that, yes. At the end of uh, workshops, uh, it's it's basically a level one instrument that we create of uh, did I create uh, or help to encourage uh, a good atmosphere in the in the um, team meeting? Uh, did you feel comfortable in sharing ideas? Certainly, uh, you could even if you look at the uh, the the uh, characteristics of a facilitator that are in the early part of these slides or certainly in the Schulte's book, you could also just on the internet uh, search on the, the characteristics of a good facilitator and then just turn those characteristics into open-ended questions or if you wanted to make it a survey in a to what extent did the facilitator listen well or to what extent do you have a feeling of trust toward the facilitator and then you can put a Likert scale together. Sure, you could do that. Okay. A couple of people have asked for additional resources, and so perhaps you might be able to tack them onto your presentation and send that out. Uh, I, I do have someone to comment. This is fun. Uh, one person says, uh, one of my clients is a nonprofit, and the team leader who sat next to me uh, in the first half thought you were really fantastic, so that's really great. Um, another person asks, who's the author of Modular Kaizen? And that would be... It would be me. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. That's good. Uh, another one asks, does the facilitator do the scribing and distribute the notes? Um, what do you think about that? I have done so to free up the team leader, but it's better for a couple of reasons. Now, if you're in a 40-person company and you've got three people total in the team, uh, yeah, maybe the facilitator is going to do anything they can do to keep the job going. That's great. Um, but the other piece is, no, the facilitator needs to keep their eyes up and watch, watch what's going on. If you're taking notes, you're looking down. If you're the facilitator, you want to be up and watching what's going on and listening to what's going on. That's another reason why if you can keep the team leader from having to take the notes 
ask somebody to be a scribe. I've been really fortunate in this Healthcare Quality Improvement Committee in that Susan Pfeiffer, who's now on the board of directors, she's one of the group technical community uh, chairs, uh, past chair of the healthcare division, uh, it will take her minutes of these meetings, and I'm scribbling like mad as the virtual chair uh, leading the meetings. And then at the end of the meeting, she'll send me her notes, and I'll merge the two of them. It's really helpful to do that. Um, and I, I will reinforce the person who said, what do you do in a small group? You do what you can to survive. Uh, but in a larger group, if you can identify a scribe uh, separately, it's a great growing and grooming um, role for somebody to have who may be new in the organization. And then you can watch them grow. Okay. Well, just one more question. If you have more after this, uh, you may uh, post them uh, to email address uh, to Grace and, and she'll get answers after the talk. This last question is, how do you adjust your approach when the team is virtual and you have fewer or lower chances to read the behaviors of the people in the room? Very good point. Very good point. Uh, and yes, that's a huge issue. In the virtual I send a lot of, not a lot, I try not to spam people, but I will send emails back and forth privately to individual members, just getting a feeling for a particular conversation they have may, may have uh, identified on some of our team uh, discussion calls. I'll follow up with them, or if we're working on a particular sub-project or subset of, of the team, uh, we will have our own private telephone calls. Uh, and we'll either use Skype if they're international or cell phones anymore. We don't pay long distance on cell phones. Uh, so yes, it really depends on the individual. But most certainly, you want to do some offline conversations. With virtual, you're right. You lose the body language. You lose the tone of voice. Now on telephones, if it's a virtual telephone call, then you get the tone of voice. But yeah, it's, it's an issue. You have to really groom those relationships. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Grace. Um, let's just have to wrap up here a little bit. Uh, again, if you have more questions, you should have Grace's email address. Uh, drop her a note. Um, you'll get an email in, in 24 hours. It will have Grace's email address in it. It will have a link to the video that we have made. And also, you'll be able to uh, ask more questions then. So uh, let's just do the just temporarily stop the recording here.